Well, the ability to learn is the most important quality of a leader. They make sure lead the nations, rise for human rights, bring in innovation, create opportunities, and to run the world's most important organizations. Women continue to shape the world through their leadership and futuristic thought. And they do not follow where the path may just lead. Go instead where there is no path and they leave a trail. Today, let's celebrate the unity for the future and technology. The key to what is ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and each one of you out there. I'm Mithun Upadhyay and very delighted to be a part of this very interesting The Economic Times and Femina presents to you Femtech, Inspiring Women Leaders in Technology. And that is a whole world in that one phrase. Inspiring Women Leaders in Technology. The theme today is promoting equitable and inclusive growth that we shape for the future as we kick start i would like to thank our partners who indeed make this even more of a great experience a big round of applause for all our partners who bring in the joy to us our presenting partner accenture powered by adobe platinum partner aws the gold partner vertib Associate Partners, Checkpoint, and Fiserv, Media Partner, Timestack.in, and Knowledge Partner, Insights, brought to you by Unwired. A big round of applause for all of them. Now, also, if you have any questions uh, in the course of the entire flow or with any of our partners, for example, Accenture, what you can do is go onto the booth, check in, any question, any query, feel free to proceed with also a lot of interesting quiz and trivia are happening in these of the booths make sure you be a part of that and also win a lot throughout the day with that thought let's get straight into our day and bring to you celebrations of the future with technology and all this around the power of women so what is our first session for the day well empowering women for inclusive growth now, this is a thought which brings in so much of perception towards what lies ahead and you will have most of your questions answered with our speakers so ladies and gentlemen and each one of you let's get straight into it and welcome our speakers for the session empowering women for inclusive growth I'm very delighted and joyful to bring to us the one and the only uh, Srimati Smriti Zubin Irani, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Women and Child Development, Government of India, in conversation with Padmaja Joshi, Executive Director, Editor of Times Now, joining us right now. So let's get straight into it and see where does the empowering of women for inclusive growth leads us into. Grateful to uh, be joined uh, by the Honorable Minister for Women and Child Development, Ms. Smriti Irani. Thank you very much, ma'am. In the middle of a very, very busy schedule, you're taking out time. Uh, you know, there are many hats that you have to wear at the same time. On the one hand, you're talking about women's rights, 
at home, in the social sphere, and then it is in the workplace. Now, when we talk about workplace, women and tech, somehow there is this impression that women and tech don't go along and it turns into a vicious circle. How can this impression be addressed? I think, Padmaja, uh, what is interesting is if historically you look at data sets with regards to where women come into positions of management or leadership, you will find, especially in uh, the corporate sector, wherever uh, positions entail economic power, the number of men surpass the number of women. If you look at historically the development of technology across the world, uh, there's a presumption that most coders are men and have always been men. There is a presumption that most innovations have happened only by men. Uh, historically, the challenge has been that when a woman experiments or innovates, uh, there is less support available for her to transition that innovation into a commercial prospect. Uh, historically, if you look at even reports by uh, organizations like McKinsey, you will find that most uh, venture capitalist funds also tend to take, uh, let's say, a, a, a kind of a, a kind of a gamble with male-led enterprises. Uh, they think that the propensity of a female-led enterprise, and this is a historical data which you can see for the past decade, a female-led innovative enterprise uh, for them has much chances of success as compared to a male-led uh, innovative enterprise. And I think that the disparity that you speak of, the prejudice that you speak from, of stems from many verticals. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the base and the foundational challenge, that resides in uh, the inclination of young girls towards STEM, science and mathematics. You will see that most complex problems that evolve post grade eight are problems for which young boys are uh, very happily put up with extra educational support in terms of extra classes that they get to take or some tuitions that parents uh, in some way uh, accept is needed for the male child. Very uh, few opportunities come where aggressively parents stand behind the female child getting that extra educational support. You will see that most of the downsizing in the STEM and the mathematics area specifically happens post grade A when the uh, subject per se gets tougher and foundationally concepts have to be strengthened. When you see the 12th standard result, you will always hear the headlines of girls surpassing boys. However, when you see their uh, transition into technology led institutions, you will still see comparatively the numbers are less. And that happens because they are not aggressively positioned to compete for such technological institutions. Today in the government, we take a lot of course to celebrate the fact that the number of STEM graduates in India who are female are coming very close to the number of male STEM graduates. In fact, we are doing better than many developed nations like the US. However, if you look at faculty positions, leadership positions in academic institutions, and don't look only at the top. I had the privilege as the HRD minister of the country to appoint Tessie Thomas as the first female chairperson of the IIT Council. Today, the Indian Statistical Institution has the first ever female director, who's also now been nominated for the Padma. But it took us 70 years to find female leadership in technical technological institutions. It is not as though we were bereft of such women of substance in the field of technology. The issue is, what do girls aspire to? So they always see male leadership in academic institutions, especially when they are technological in nature, technical in nature. Then they go out and see in business and enterprise, male leadership in innovative technology-based companies. And I think that is where this conversation of prejudice gets heightened. So today, what is essential is there's a recent report by the chairperson of NASCOM that the Indian tech industry has crossed $200 billion in revenue and created over 4 lakh jobs, half of which have gone to women. Mm -hmm. Now, if you sit and segregate what kind of jobs that have gone to women, I remember 10, 12 years ago, I went to BARC, Baba Atomic Research Center. 75% of the administrative staff was female. 
but only 30% of the scientific staff is female. It's not as if we don't have female scientists. Mm -hmm. So it has taken a long time for the transition to happen. But I am glad that now at least the wheels are turning. And in many an area, they're turning very fast. And I think one of the greatest indications of that is the success of the Mutra Yojana. Lovely. So at least when that overall image of beti doctor banegi, beta engineer banega, we get out of that, then more women will also aspire to be in that field. But I think that I think that adage that you've just used also highlights what kind of jobs we have societally felt compelled to position girls in. Hmm. So when you talk about doctor banegi, it is presumed that she will take a position of a caregiver. Yeah. And when you say beta engineer banega, it is pre presumed that he has the capacity to build. Mm -hmm. So with all due respect to every engineer, Tessie Thomas was an equal participant in the Indian missile program. Mm -hmm. But till this government came into position of service, you barely had heard of her. Mm -hmm. So I think that is where, again, conversations need to change. Mm -hmm. That will women always be in positions or jobs that you presume to be as caregivers? Mm -hmm. For instance, you as an anchor, I'm sure if a male anchor is extremely harsh, is caustic, he will not get the same backlash that you would get as a female for asking tough questions. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, not, this is not a prejudice that is limited to, let's say, technology or other uh, limited sectors. It is a given for women across. Mm -hmm. If you have a mind of your own, if you can debate on deliverables, if you can debate and understand substance of the issue on which you are engaging on, and if you're tough, then you're a difficult woman. So that is said for all women, uh, not limited to technology. I think we've hit at the root of the problem of how some professions have just been gendered all this while. The bossy versus the assertive, the caregiver so versus... The and women have only two verticals between which they oscillate. So they can either be abla nari or they can be bossy. <laughs> So you either want to help them because they just can't help themselves or the presumption is they're so bad that you need to isolate them. I'm sorry, I almost sound like it's better, better to be bossy than to be abla. But your so I, think that, I think that we need to fight both these prejudicial assumptions about female professionals. Absolutely. That if a woman knows much about her job, and she says in a group meeting, fine, I've heard everybody out, but this is what I want done because I know what I'm doing. Vis-a-vis, hmm. -vis, the same position being taken by a man. This is what affects leadership. So when you sit, sorry, when you, I've spoken to many women who are uh, scientific in nature and I've always asked them, what has been your greatest challenge? They say the evaluation. For progression, whenever we sit for a promotion, the evaluator says, Are, aapki to umar kam hai, aap to shadi karoge, fir aapki to bachche honge. And the woman says that as though this was a part of my work profile. I mean, if I deliver on issues that you've earmarked for me as deliverables by the end of my year, shouldn't that be the only factor on which you judge me? If you're a woman 40 plus, they say, Are, young ones ko thoda samay do na, aaj unki baari hai. So you're neither here nor there. If you are 50 plus, they are telling you, Abhi to aapki kuch saalo mein retirement hai. So aap itna aggressively isko kyo pursue kar rahe ho? That's what I'm saying. There are many. Every age has its own challenge. And the idea is to recognize that challenge and then not normalize such conversations in organizations. In fact, and these women who are now breaking the mold are challenging exactly those perceptions. Speaking of women in tech, uh, what do you make of some of the unicorns which are being funded and led by women entrepreneurs? What's your view on having more women in the tech space, especially when it comes to the unicorns? If you look at that, also the numbers are comparatively limited. Uh, I would rather have women and uh, led enterprises surpass men led enterprises for a change. <laughs> and I say this from two perspectives. One, you talk about aspiration. Hmm. So when, if you remember when the Mars mission uh, and the whole ISRO story of a woman-led space venture came out, there were many youngsters, irrespective of their gender, who found that very, very 
um, enabling. The fact that you do not need to fit into a particular structural mold physically, academically, to become an aspirational issue, I think was the great story of, of the female-led ISRO team. And I think that today when you talk about unicorns, apart from the Nike story, how many other stories have been brought to the forefront? We always wait for the 8th of March to highlight the achievers. But we don't hear of those achievements for the rest of the year. But for the rest of the year, the noise around other achievers overwhelms. Mm -hmm. So at times, there is a need to introspect that should these stories be told more often. If you sit with a, if you sit with a checklist, Padmavya, you will find the same list of women achievers who has been felicitated every year. We need to sit and check the list of the new women that we've added. And if that number doesn't overwhelm you, that means that there is a lot which still needs to be done in terms of celebration of those achievements. Mm. Do we always look at achievements from a leadership at an urban point of view? So today you talk about the unicorns. How many times have you heard about the achievements of women, young or middle-aged, with respect to innovation? which comes societally forward. Many such names you are hearing because government projects those names to position them as aspirational figures in our country. The prime minister has consistently engaged with such women, brought their stories to the fore. But let me just give you a small example. You've had lakhs of women who are now bank sakhis. How many of us identify that bank sakhi in our own district and that make her story the aspirational story. Because she amalgamates in her job, tech and finance. She is not somebody who is Ivy League. She is somebody who has educated herself in a local educational institution, connected herself to a service delivery process with a bank which is local, and is servicing local financial and technology needs. How many of us have celebrated that female potential? That has not become a story ever. Actually, a lot of these names, now that you mention it, the government seems to have made it a concerted effort, especially if you look at the Padma Awards. Many ladies who are working at the grassroots over the last four years have been recognized, awarded with Padmas exactly for doing that. The disparity, I want to touch on that. While it's great, you know, we celebrate any kind of achievement, especially when it comes to women, a lot of questions are also asked about whether women who are already financially strong from an urban background, perhaps even come from a privileged background in terms of having an established business, they are leading when it comes even now to women in tech. Can the women at the grassroots be enabled with technology to make their space? In that so area. how is how is the technology enablement happening, Padmaja? A lot of talk goes out uh, with regards to AI, all right, and how AI throws up new opportunities. Now there has been a professor at Penn State, uh, a lady in a, if I'm not uh, lady or gentleman, whoever was a professor at Penn State, who said that if you're feeding in historical data into an algorithm and an AI tool is supposed to recommend new jobs for women, does your historical data have the propensity to in some way facilitate that algorithm to give new opportunities for women? Do you have that historical data? So I think that many a times when we talk about technology, we talk about machine learning, we talk about AI, we talk about blockchain, but it has to be fed in with data to reach a particular analysis or to present a viable solution. How much of our data sets are uh, from a gender perspective aligned well to the needs of women? And who in the industry has done a study of the same? For all of those watching right now, this is definitely a, <laughs> an area where you have a wide, wide opening that you can uh, fulfill this presence. For instance, if I talk about women in STEM, how many of those girls are inclined towards chemistry? How many of them are uh, proponents of physics? 
how many of them are uh, inclined towards biology or how many of them have the potential to maximize their opportunity through maths do we have that data set today mm -hmm. and are we looking at data from a gender skew mm -hmm. that is a question so if you want to service the urban and rural needs of women through technology mm -hmm. does our data have that gender skew mm -hmm. so there is much that the government has done for instance when i spoke about mudra mudra was not a gender based funding opportunity but women showed their potential and now are 70% beneficiaries of that scheme there are 32 crore loans given under mudra in the entire country 70% is a huge female opportunity that was created but from a corporate inter point of view have has anybody sat down and segregated what are the kinds of businesses that women are most inclined towards what are the kind of let's say npas or for that matter robust businesses that have come out in those particular fields which are particularly led by women and which are those women who started small but now have the capacity to be mid size we are consistently speaking the government has progressed from mudra yojana to start up to stand up to take the value of support to a female led business from 50000 rupees to 1 crore rupees the issue is have we created enough opportunity in corporate india to ensure that we just do not limit ourselves to the sme segment and having more and more women flood that particular segment how many of us have made the conscious effort of taking women from the sme segment to the mid size company segment how many of us have created opportunities for females who own mid size enterprises to be unicorns or for that matter to be big corporations Mm -hmm. so till such time and i've been consistently making this appeal to industry for the past two years till such time we do not have a dedicated effort i think that the challenge will sustain for a little more period of time the issue is the government has stepped up can industry we and you padmaja i remember have consistently spoken about the need to have more female uh, leaders on on corporate boards has that needle moved as much as we would have wanted it to we have to go beyond the women's day tokenism and it has to be a sustained effort like the minister has said if we come to technology and your ministry in particular ma'am what has your ministry done in the last 7 years to use technology to further your aims and initiatives especially when it comes to women Uh, but Nijam, uh, if you remember, in the year 2012-13, I was uh, as a member of opposition speaking on issues such as the Foxo Act, Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act, and at that time, I had consistently maintained that if you want to ensure security and safety of women at workplace and children in educational institutions, you need a database mm -hmm. of those who are sexual offenders. so that if police verification has to be done it is not limited to your local thana there is a national database against which you can do an analysis and then alert systems in your district in your state about such offenders roaming free some on bail some who served their sentence i'm extremely grateful that the ministry of home affairs has created that database what is not pleasing though is that the database now has data sets for over 7 lakh sexual offenders but at least we know where to cross match we collaborated with the ministry of education and with school boards to say that let's now propose to every school management that if you are to hire people who are in the vicinity of your educational institution have access to women and children please do a police verification the prime minister was insistent on ensuring that every district has a one stop center where women get psychological medical and police support we set up in the past 4 years over 700 such one stop centers and provided support to over 5 lakh females who are victims of violence uh, the government of india set up under the prime minister's aegis close to 35 helplines in the country which have serviced and provided support to over 60 lakh women in the budget there was an announcement of additional one stop centers 300 in number in districts which are high burden areas of crime simultaneously 
and my ministry it amalgamates efforts across many government ministries and departments. We did not have a penny spent in the year 2013-14 on the Nirbhaya Fund. When the Modi government came into position, we have actually processed projects worth 9,000 crores. 3,500 crore rupees has already been given to states. So when you see the ads that state governments do on emergency response systems, that is the money that the central government is sending to state governments. Mm -hmm. When you see the safe transport systems in the Safe Cities Project, that is the money that the government of India is sending to states to ensure better transportation systems for women in states. When you see added infrastructure to be given in courts for children and women, that is money that is going in the government of India's coffers under the Nirbhaya Fund. When you see the Victim Compensation Fund, which is being given to victims of uh, rape and violence in state, that is money going out of the MHA, which is the Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, we have also consistently worked on issues such as Bedi Bachao, Bedi Padhao, which has become now a Janandula. The Prime Minister was insistent that you ensure that people recognize the need to save the girl child, but not limit yourself to that, but also educate the girl child. Uh, it is a matter of great joy that the national education policy never before in the history of our country ever had a dedicated fund to ensure the gender balance in education. The Gender Inclusion Fund has been created for the first time ever. So consistently across government, through efforts of all ministries, women have become central. Gender budgeting has received a genuine push and positioning amongst all ministries. Now ministries are becoming more and more conscious about their gender inclined spend. So for instance, when we engage with the Ministry of Road Transport, some people told me, is me kya female fund hua? This is just construction of a road. However, our engagement with the Road Transport Ministry has brought us data sets about how many toilets have been positioned across highways and such infrastructure projects that have come up. The fact that toilets became the buzzword and 10 crore plus toilets have been built. But more than that, I think the silent revolution that Ayushman Bharat Yojana has got is fantastic. And I'm only speaking from the perspective of breast cancer, cervical cancer. We remember Padmaja, they've been conversation after conversation about how rural women will never come out and talk about scanning themselves for breast cancer. They would never come out and talking about their private parts having cancer, cervical cancer. They would never talk about their cervix because they never had the means. People presume they never had the knowledge, but that was not the question. When the prime minister provided for five that would be medical cover for those 10 crore families, Health Ministry, and we've been uh, extremely grateful that they gave us those data sets. Over two and a half crore women, especially in the rural setup, have gotten themselves scanned for these kind of cancers, which was not a possibility, which is not a, a conversation that was had seven years ago. So the government, be it health, be it education, be it public safety and security, today the government has ensured that every police station in the country has a female helpline and a desk. So the engagement by the government has been on various facets that affect the life of women. Today, when we sanction money for a working women's hostel, earlier, there was Bandarbat in the UPA era. What we are doing is to ensure that we cross-match numbers with the Ministry of Labor to see where is the propensity of women going for labor or for academic activity, and then ensuring that we build infrastructure accordingly. So there is a lot of amalgamation and assimilation of efforts, and that is why it's bearing fruit. Unfortunately, that partnership between departments in government was not seen during the UPA era. And I'm not saying this. There have been ministers in the UPA era who have positioned themselves such and publicly declared that, yes, we've had a breakdown of communication in the government. That's why we cannot service the needs of citizens. That is not the case. And the prime minister himself has positioned himself central to providing for the needs of women and children in our country. So ma'am, in conclusion, uh, do you think in the coming days, there is going to be a narrowing of the gap between women and tech and how? I think that on five instances, I'm extremely buoyant. One, that the number of STEM graduates who are female are coming slowly and sneakily at par with men. Second, there is now an understanding in corporate India that 
it is all right to take a if they so call it gamble on female led enterprises which are innovative especially with many unicorns which are now uh, positioned to do very well which are led by uh, women thirdly i think that there is an understanding foundationally in academic institutions and amongst parents that young girls need additional support to strengthen their foundational learnings in maths and science um fourthly i think that there is also in higher educational institution now a transition to have more and more female academic leadership come to the fore we have the first ever female vc of the jnu as as one such example and lastly in all these efforts you've had consistent support given by the government that the government is equally partnering on issues which are ensuring gender buoyancy in all sectors i think is something that gives me a lot of hope that the wheels are turning and now they're turning faster well thank you very much for aiding the those wheels in turning one is the government push and then as a society we need to change the gendered roles that have been imposed so far or just have developed over time when it comes to certain professions thank you very much as always ms smriti irani it's been a pleasure speaking to you thank you thank you well what an interesting start to femtech and those numbers and stats it gives you so much insight about what's really happening and what is the future like i want to thank our orator padmada joshi executive editor of times now alongside uh, the one and only smriti uh, smriti zubin rani honorable minister ministry of women and child development government of india with that and let's get into what is next here at femtech well thriving in the digital first era 